Hello everybody and welcome to 2024. Back in June last year, I headed over with the rest of the Shipshape crew to Australia, a country that turns out to have far more preserved naval history than you would expect, and as we'll see over the subsequent months, probably more of certain elements of general British and Commonwealth naval history than we have back here in Britain. Slightly paradoxically, we left on a day that, as you can see from this takeoff run, was unusually bright and warm for the UK. In fact, having dressed for what the weather had been like the day before, I was slightly overheating in the airport and thus was actually relatively glad to get off the ground because this, this is not what you expect on a early June day in the UK. I mean, yes, it's summer, but uh, UK summers, we don't believe in the sun. Various shipshape crew members had taken different routes to Australia. Me and Dan were on this flight, which was a Qantas flight, heading for our first city of call, that being the Western Australian city of Perth. As we took off, I decided I'd use the daylight hours, such as they were and such as we could see out the windows, to spot a few things that I would recognise. So we were heading east, of course, so we headed east over London. This is Twickenham and the early part of the River Thames. So if you have a passing interest in rugby, there's Twickenham Stadium over there on the left for you. If you like railways, there's a nice railway running through there. And of course, the River Thames, somewhat important in Britain's naval development, although this is just about as far upriver as you can go. This is the very top end of the tidal Thames, just to the right you hit Teddington and it's the non-tidal Thames. Dr. Clark had elected to take the fractionally more expensive but apparently slightly nicer stopping flight via Singapore, and since I had made the, as it turned out, rather poor decision, albeit a cost-effective one, to go via economy, I was stuck in this window seat for the next 17 hours and... Let's just say if it wasn't for noise cancelling headphones, I probably would have killed someone halfway through the flight. Nonetheless, we continued our journey over London. So shout out to any of my former colleagues in Richmond Council who may be watching. I know it's a relatively unlikely thing, but, you know, in early June, if you noticed a uh, slightly waddling Qantas aircraft lumbering into the sky, well, I could see you and maybe you saw me. And then we headed out over the London skyline. I did try and use my zoom camera to see if I could pick out a shot of HMS Belfast. Unfortunately, at the angle we were at, flying basically over southern London, uh, she was obscured by various buildings. We wore a course to the southeast and passed over this area. Now, for those of you who are very familiar with what the, the coastline of northern Europe looks like, you will, of course, recognise down here on the left is Ostend, and up there on the right is Zeebrugge, Obviously, the site of the Ostend and Zeebrugge raids of World War One, Flanders Flotilla and all that. You can see just how shallow the water is. And you can also see the Ostend Canal, which goes along with the Zeebrugge Canal all the way over to Brugge, which is just off to the right there, or as us heathen English usually pronounce it, Bruges. Apologies to any Belgian listeners. I probably should mention at this point that as we took off, the flight route computer took us on a rather worrying direct route over western Ukraine south and southern Crimea and then the northern part of the Black Sea. I didn't think I'd booked on that particular airline. Uh, fortunately, somewhere over Serbia, we took a little bit of a detour, which is why I'm still here to talk to you. Somewhere over Turkey, we saw these rather stunning mountains. Uh, no particular naval relation. It was just a really, really nice sight. And uh, further along, there was actually a city perched on top of one of these mountains, or I guess maybe at least a town. We then hit cloud cover and subsequently nightfall and headed on our way over the Indian Ocean. According to the flight tracker, we made a rather interesting semicircular detour just to the southwest of the southern tip of India, so I think we were probably dodging some kind of major weather system, although of course it was far too dark to tell. I also spent an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out in the pitch darkness what the weird blinking lights in the far distance were before, after a slight turn and a... Uh, backlight from some of the city lights further on in the trip. I think we were somewhere over the Middle East at that point. I realised what I'd been desperately trying to figure out were our wingtip lights. And then, of course, because of course it would be my luck, having taken off from a completely unseasonably hot and dry UK, heading for Australia, of course, known for being nice and warm, uh, we landed in Perth to grey skies and pouring rain. 
I did kind of wonder if we'd accidentally done the trip backwards, but nonetheless, apparently this is relatively typical Perth weather, because of course, being well over the other side of the equator, this was the equivalent of their winter. We were met by a very kind subscriber who then drove me and Dan over to our hotel, although as it turned out, uh, that was slightly different hotels because they're two hotels with the same name within a mile of each other and we'd accidentally booked different ones. Nonetheless, those of you who were on the Discord thread for the Australia trip will re remember that I had a genius plan to hire a car in Perth the following day and drive down to Albany, which on the map didn't seem like it was too far away to start the trip mostly because they wanted a ridiculous amount of money for a 45 minute to one hour flight to Albany, which would have been my other choice. However, a bunch of uh, the you wonderful Western Australian subscribers chimed in and essentially said that one, that's a lot further than you think it is. Two, uh, if you are unused to driving in Australia, you'll probably die. And then proceeded to explain to me that not only would it take a four to five hour drive each way, but as a non-native, I would be unused to the concept of Rue time, or as I quickly dubbed it, Rugnarok, uh, which essentially adds up to if you drive in certain hours of the early morning or early evening, there will be a lot of kangaroos on the road. Uh, there's a reason a lot of Australian vehicles have rather large bull bars or crash bars on the front. And of course, if I'm not used to dodging large wildlife with no consideration for its own safety, which as a Brit, I must confess I'm not, then I was probably going to end up on the roadside in a rather smashed up hire car. But also being a rather practical as well as friendly lot, uh, I received a couple of offers from wonderful Australian subscribers to actually drive me there instead, which resulted in me getting up at about four in the morning and heading out before Roo time with a rather wonderful Australian subscriber who took me all the way to Albany and back. So absolutely massive shout out to you. You know who you are. And it turned out the jet lag was a lot worse than I thought because I ended up sleeping through about half of each trip. So it was yet yeah, definitely just as well I didn't try and drive solo in a hire car. Nonetheless, that is a brief summary of how I ended up in Australia. And now we are going to start our look at the naval history of Australia as gathered by the Shipshape uh, June 2023 tour by looking at where I was on the first day, uh, the wonderful town of Albany and its associated naval history attractions, as well as the history itself. So buckle in. Albany is one of the oldest European founded sites in Australia. Australia as a continent had been known about for several centuries, but actual colonisation only took place towards the end of the 18th century. At that point, of course, it was the rather famous convict fleets that set up on the east coast of Australia. But in the 1820s, it was worried that the French might try and set up their own colony and stake their own claims on the western coast of Australia. And so a small group was sent out to start a garrison, essentially, on the western coast of Australia, with the intent, of course, of staking the British claim to the entire subcontinent. And thus, its entire history technically relates to naval concerns, because, of course, the French would only be able to get to Australia by sea. And one of the major concerns with the French staking a claim in Western Australia would be that any potential French holdings would sit directly astride the best trade and access and communication routes between Britain and its colonies on the East Coast. And all of this is recorded in good detail at the Museum of the Great Southern in Albany, which is where we stopped. It's a small museum, but one that's packed with quite a bit of different information covering Albany's history, obviously a lot of it relating to the sea. One of the most obvious bits, as you can see here, is this, the Brig Amity. And the reason that we're looking at this particular brig is that the Amity was in fact the ship that brought the first settlers, albeit a lot of them were convicts, over to Albany to start up that garrison, obviously with a military guard as well. Now, as you might appreciate from this initial drone flyby, she is not the largest of ships. She's also not Australian native as a ship. She was actually built in all, of all places in Canada then eventually chartered to Australia, turning up on the Australian East Coast, where she also actually helped found the first 
colony in Queensland, that's the northeastern portion of Australia, in the early 1820s, before then being chartered again to come down from the Australian east coast to the Australian southwest coast, which is where she landed in the area that's now Albany to found a town that was at the time called Friedrichtown, but was then later renamed to Albany. The naming convention originally having been named out of Prince Friedrich, who was the Duke of York and Albany, and you can guess where the Albany bit came from. And as you might surmise, this was the only European presence on the western side of Australia, because European presence in Australia at this point was essentially confined to the area around Botany Bay and what's now Sydney, the area around what's now Brisbane, which we just mentioned Amity had a vital role in colonising, and a little bit of what was called Van Damien's land, as now called Tasmania. Having just about managed to found Albany at the closing days of 1826, Amity would continue to supply and support colonisation efforts along the western coast of Australia and in general, including shuttling back and forth to other British holdings like Singapore to bring in supplies and further colonists. She was also quite heavily involved in bringing people to Perth and Fremantle, although Perth and Fremantle are now part of one larger urban conurbation a little bit to the north. The original Amity was actually wrecked in the 1840s whilst transporting cattle back in southeastern Australia. And this Amity is in fact a replica, but a replica that's been around for a surprisingly long time. She was built by a team led by a local sailor, shipwright and historian named Stan Austin back in the 1970s and completing it just in time for the celebration of Albany's 150th anniversary in 1976, which in turn makes this replica almost 50 years old, which actually means it's been around longer than the original Amity was, because the original Amity was launched in 1816 and wrecked in 1845, and thus only had a lifespan of about 29 years. He actually wrote a book about the process to rediscover what Amity would have looked like and rebuilt her, which you can find in most good bookshops, although I suspect there's more copies around in Australia than overseas, and I was reliably informed by some of the guides who actually work at the Museum of the Great Southern that uh, the opening of Amity back in 1976 was a perfect example of Australian bureaucracy, but also the general attitude of good old Australians like Stan, because having led the team that rebuilt this replica, or built it, I suppose, he was then not invited to the opening where the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh uh, were going to be guests through some bureaucratic oversight, but he didn't raise a big fuss, he just paid his regular public admission fee and watched with the rest of the general public instead. Now one thing you'll immediately notice is she's not a very large vessel at all. She is a brig, which means she has two masts only, and the bowsprit, as you can see here from these overhead shots. And, well, along with other replicas of small typical ships of the time, like the Golden Hind replica you can find up in London, it really does give you an idea of just exactly how difficult and dangerous it was to conduct the early voyages of exploration that occurred throughout the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, and in Amity's cases, early 19th century. We might associate the 19th century with perhaps things being a bit more settled, but people were still making transoceanic voyages in a vessel that to be honest, as you can see from this slightly higher orbit, was not that much larger than a small to medium-sized building. And in fact, as you can see as we pan round, the little Museum of the Great Southern, which is the uh, beige building complex directly at the top of the screen right now, and a little bit to the right, the museum is actually larger than the ship by a considerable amount. And as we said, it's not the world's largest museum, although it is a very good museum. And another thing which you can see here is that she still has gun ports, and you see there's a cannon there on the right, because whilst we are talking the early period of Pax Britannica in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, there's still a reasonable risk of pirates and other armed individuals out there on the open ocean, and of course just because Britain had won the Napoleonic Wars the year before Amity was launched, there was no way of knowing that Britain wouldn't be involved in another major war fairly soon thereafter, hence the need for armament. Plus, of course, there was a multiplicity of small conflicts that still went on 
and so the ability of the ship to defend itself was quite important. But enough flying around. You can also go inside the ship and get an idea of where 45 people to form the initial town of Albany, plus the crew, plus the livestock, plus all the supplies, somehow had to be fitted. I can only conclude this was an early 19th century game of Tetris in human form. Uh, but nonetheless, this is the slightly posher eating area, as, as you can tell, it is a little bit better lit because it's directly under the skylight. And this is the only continuous deck that's fully covered inside the ship. So if you've been on something like Constitution, Unicorn, Trincomalee, ver uh, various preserved frigates, you'll be used to the fact there are a, a couple of decks, even if there aren't quite as many as a first rate like HMS Victory. But on Amity, you've got the open deck above and then this deck and that's it so these are some of your accommodation spaces and no this isn't a mezzanine as you can see the floor is actually rising with the curve of the hull here so this is just a little bit of storage space under a bunk and the reason it's had to be raised like this is just to ensure that you can use the full width of the ship's hull at this particular point and you've got the beams there supporting the deck above you and of course, bearing in mind that to get a bunk like this was the height of luxury, the vast majority of people aboard would either have to be sleeping in hammocks, or if you were really unlucky, just sleeping on whichever bit of deck space you could find that hopefully wasn't completely sopping wet, because the voyage was uh, a more than a little bit beset by storms. And then coming forward, we enter the main cargo area of the vessel, and you might be surprised just how much was brought with Amity on her voyage to found Albany. The list provided by the ship includes just over four and a half thousand pounds of salt beef, just over 2,750 pounds of salt pork, just over 2,700 pounds of ship's biscuit, uh, 12 and a half thousand pounds of flour in casks, of course, several hundred pounds of tea because this was a British expedition, just over 860 pounds of rice, 64 pints of oatmeal, just over 1,100 pints of peas, just over 1,200 pounds of sugar, four dozen bottles of wine, presumably that was the officers. Then you also had 88 pounds of lime juice, because that got rid of scurvy, 560 pounds of raisins, 360 pounds of salt, 150 bushels of maize, 672 pounds of hay, because you also had rams, ewes, boars, sows, geese, ducks, chickens, a bull, a cow, and a horse aboard. So you had to feed them. 531 pounds of soap to keep everybody nice and clean. 56 pounds of arrowroot. I'm presuming that was for medicinal purposes. I'm not entirely sure what arrowroot is or what it does. The last time I came across it, I think, was Dragon Age Inquisition. Uh, but there was also just under 600 pounds of tobacco, because, of course, there weren't any anti-smoking laws at the time. And as you might notice, we've worked our way out of the cargo hold and into the bow. And this is what's directly above that previous view. So this is obviously the ship's bow sprit. And what you'll notice here, apart from it being fairly typical for a bow sprit, you've also got down on the bottom right this kind of horizontal cylinder type thing with a little flap on it now this is typical of smaller age of sail ships and older ships this is an earlier kind of technology that predates the capstan and was still in use on small vessels because it was easier to mount as you can see it just mounts on the open deck and you can see the little slots you would put beams in and ratchet the thing back to haul up your anchors it was a bit more dangerous than the capstan as well which is why warships tended to use the latter and then just doing a quick 180, you can see down pretty much the full length of the ship. Obviously, they don't have any of the cannon aboard. They're all off just to the side, which you hopefully saw during the drone shots. But once Albany was founded, her naval involvement was relatively quiet for the rest of the 19th century, whilst they were panicking a little bit about the Russians coming down the eastern coast of Australia, hence Cerberus, which we will see in a later video. Over on, in Western Australia, there was a little bit less concern about potential foreign naval adventures up until the end of the 19th century when the Western Australian area started to be fortified a little bit, which we'll see again in another video when we move up to Perth and Rocknest Island. As a result, Albany's next major brush with all things naval was in 1908 with the arrival of the Great White Fleet. Now, if you remember that map back earlier on in the video, or if you just want to look at Google Maps, there are three main areas of water 
around Albany. There is Princess Royal Harbour, which is the inner harbour on which Albany actually mostly is, Albany to the north of Princess Royal Harbour. Then leading out of that is King George Sound, which is a wider sheltered area, obviously with a little bit deeper water. And just to the north of that is Oyster Harbour, but that doesn't seem to have prefigured in anything particularly naval related. But in any case, the Great White Fleet came into Princess Royal Harbour, having already visited Sydney and Melbourne and on their way up to Manila in the Philippines. However, this visit, whilst obviously it was celebrated by everybody involved, was more logistical than PR because the colliers that were supposed to supply the Great White Fleet, well, as I've covered in the video on the Great White Fleet, were never particularly numerous and in this particular case hadn't actually shown up in Australia in time. And so Albany, which was a stopping point for Royal Navy ships, which would need coal on their way to and from and around Australia, as well as obviously the local Australian vessels, would be able to supply the Great White Fleet with coal so that they could make their way up to Manila without you know, the embarrassment of running out of fuel. Because whilst they would have taken on supplies in Sydney and Melbourne, as anyone who lives in Australia will tell you, and as I can now verify, Australia is very, very big. Uh, I've taken longer flights now getting to and from various cities in Australia than I would need to take to go the entire length of Europe. There's a reason Australia is called a subcontinent. Albany's next taste of naval matters would actually come relatively soon thereafter. Four years later, the outbreak of the First World War saw Australia and New Zealand entering on the side of Britain. And that meant the raising of the Anzacs, the Australia and New Zealand Army Corps. But how to get them from Australasia as a whole over to the front lines in what at that point was still primarily a European theatre. There was Australian involvement in the Pacific section using HMAS Australia and other elements of the fleet, but that's a story for other portions of Australia. The first plans consisted of taking 10 ships from New Zealand, mostly requisition passenger liners and cargo ships, which would sail as a convoy, and then ships from Australia, including slower horse transports and faster troop transports, would leave their various ports on a timed schedule, which in theory would see a single unified convoy form up somewhere in the Indian Ocean. However, there were a number of German warships thought to be extant in the area, primarily, and in actuality, the Emden, and since there weren't enough warships around to undertake the various other roles Australia was, or the Australian Navy was taking part in, in the opening stages of World War II, one plus escort many individual ships, it was decided that instead the New Zealand ships would be escorted over to Albany, and the Australian vessels would leave from their various ports, travel along the Australian coast, and also arrive in Albany, all collecting together in King George Sound, where they could then be escorted as one massive troop convoy, the so-called First Convoy, which would then be safely escorted across the Indian Ocean to wherever it was they were needed. As Of course, as we know, they actually mostly ended up at Gallipoli. At first, it was suggested that Fremantle should actually be the place where the ships would assemble until it was pointed out that Albany, specifically with King George Sound, had a far larger safe harbour and there were a lot of ships being gathered. A total of 38 troop ships, 28 from Australia, 10 from New Zealand, carrying almost 29,000 men and just over 7,000 horses, plus four escorting warships, the Australian light cruisers HMAS Sydney and HMAS Melbourne, which were World War One era British town-class derivatives, the British armoured cruiser Minotaur, and the Japanese armoured cruiser-proto-battle cruiser Ibuki, bearing in mind that, of course, the Japanese were part of the Anglo-Japanese alliance and had entered on the British side in World War One as well. Under the overall command of Captain Arthur Gordon Smith of the Royal Navy, the convoy was fully assembled and set out on the 1st of November 1914. This departure was somewhat delayed by trying to work out what SMS Emden was doing, and Smith actually flew his flag in one of the troop transports, the Orvieto, partly because as a captain, whilst he might have seniority over some other captains, he was still a captain and all the 
escorting warships had captains, which could have made things a little bit awkward. But it also meant that should any situations arise where warships had to manoeuvre away from the convoy, Smith could remain with the convoy, he could direct the actions of the warships without obviously then losing contact and coordination with the convoy itself. And whilst four ships might not seem like a massive escort for an incredibly important troop convoy, it was actually a pretty solid protective force, bearing in mind that there weren't going to be any German U-boats in the Indian Ocean, pretty much at all in World War I, and certainly not this early on, which meant the threat was surface raiders. Now, while there were a couple of German light cruisers poking around in the Indian Ocean, Emden at one end and another one over on the western side, the biggest fear really was Admiral von Spee's East Asia Squadron, which, as we know, was actually heading eastwards itself, heading over the Pacific. But even if von Spee's squadron had been around, Minotaur, which you can see here in the centre of the picture, was more than a match for either Scharnhorst or Gneisenau, and she was a last-generation armoured cruiser, to say nothing of the Ibuki, which was even more overkill. And that's the ship over on the left. So with a pretty big hefty punch in the larger ships, that left the two town class, and they were some of the best light cruisers of the early World War I period, compared to the light cruisers that von Spee had to hand, they would have been able to either handle them or at least hold them off long enough for Ibuki and Minotaur to fi finish off the larger targets and come help them clean up. And this proved to be a wise precaution because eight days into the voyage, there came an emergency signal from a radio station that was under attack by SMS Emden. And so the choice became, well, do we let Emden slip away into the Great Blue Yonder, or do we try and deal with it now? The captain of HMAS Sydney was ordered to take his ship, as you can see here, and head out to deal with Emden. The Japanese Ibuki really wanted to go out and deal with Emden. However, it was pointed out that as powerful as Ibuki might be, and therefore as ridiculously overkill as it might be, she was, however, a bit slower which meant that if Emden got a good sighting of her, she might make a break for it and escape. And so it was that the Australian ship headed out. Even if she'd been dockyard fresh, poor old Emden was outmassed, outgunned, outranged, outsped, and outarmoured by Sydney, who decided, as any sensible captain does, that when you have all the advantages, a fair fight is not something you want to involve yourself in. And so Sydney just kept using her range advantage and her heavier guns to bombard Emden into so much scrap. With that, and the subsequent trap and destruction of SMS Königsberg over on the western side of the Indian Ocean, the route for further troop convoys and trade in general in the Indian Ocean was pretty much clear, as a result of which the slightly smaller second convoy would actually set out with only a pair of escorts, and even then only technically, consisting of only one armed merchant ship, which was towing the submarine AE-2, which technically could have been used as a second vessel in case of absolute emergency. A lot more information about the first and second troop convoys, the Anzacs in general, what they did during World War I, and the Australian Navy as a whole, can be found at the Anzac Memorial and Museum, which is just up the road, quite literally, from the Museum of the Great Southern, and it's located at the same site as Albany's primary fortifications and gun defences, which both overlook Prince George Sound and the interior Princess Royal Harbour. It's officially known as the Princess Royal Fortress Military Museum, with the National Anzac Centre located within it, in case you're looking for a Google reference or something. And I do highly recommend a visit. It's, again, like the Museum of the Great Southern, it's a very well done museum and because it's on the site of a major fortification is a little bit larger as well so combining the two in a single visit will occupy pretty much most of your day as you can see in the tunnels around some of the gun emplacements they've actually got a cut through which shows you how a six inch gun works and you can then walk up to see some of the original guns in their various locations now <laughs> As you can tell, yes, it was raining, and in fact, the rain got worse and worse during the day. There was thunder and lightning, and yes, of course, we were climbing to the very top of the highest point in the area, surrounded by a bunch of heavy metal. So quite how we weren't struck down, I'm not entirely sure, but 
nonetheless, we did survive, which just goes to show that it is in fact a relatively safe area. This gun is undergoing a bit of restoration, as you can see by the barriers and safety tape around it. And who knows, by the time this video goes out, they may have finished that particular restoration piece. As you can see, both guns have been uh, painted relatively recently with this nice green paint, which, well, it's helping to preserve them. Although, as you can tell, the weather is doing its level best to unpreserve them. But they do look in pretty good condition for in-place memorial guns. They've also got bits of the fortifications that didn't survive. You can see this is part of the gun shield for a 1900s pattern gun brought all the way over from the UK. And this kind of very curved gun shield is in fact quite common on a number of Australian coastal fortifications because they largely all date from the late 19th and very early 20th centuries, which is when this kind of gun shield was actually quite predominant in at least coastal emplacements and some at sea emplacements on ships in various elements of the British Empire. And those big panoramic shots of the first convoy that you saw earlier in the video, they were taken from up here on this fortress. So out on the viewing platform, they have a rather handy little guide to both the first convoy and the second convoy, where you can see all the ships nicely tabulated, you know, who they were transporting, what their names were, what their relative positions were, etc., etc. So if you want to work out exactly what a particular ship was, you can do that whilst obviously overlooking the bay that they were in. I always think it's quite nice to be able to actually visit the points where specific photographs were taken because it helps you, especially in landscapes like this, visualize a little bit more what it might have been like. Uh, for that reason, I'm really excited to go at some point in the future to Malta to find out where exactly it was in the Grand Harbour that all those shots of Royal Navy ships were taken. The museum is spread out over quite a number of separate buildings. Of course, the largest building is the Anzac Memorial tells the story specifically of the Anzacs. I have covered the initial attacks on the Dardanelles from the sea in a previous video, but whilst there is an, obviously a fairly strong naval element in the Gallipoli campaign itself, the actual landings, I'm a naval historian, I'm not an army historian, and so if I'm going to tell the story of the Anzacs and perhaps show some stuff from the memorial, then that's going to have to be in conjunction with an army historian who understands the land side of the campaign a lot better. But in one of the other buildings, well, many other buildings, you have, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a miniature, <laughs> um, more of a, a scale model of a number of different uh, Australian warships of different descriptions. You can see some uniforms in the background there as well. This is, of course, AE2. Uh, the second Australian submarine, and uh, slightly more successful than poor old AE-1. AE-2 would have a brief career operating in the Dardanelles and Gallipoli area before being sunk, but she did get to torpedo a target or two beforehand. The gift shop is remarkably well stocked, actually, with a variety of interesting things to acquire. I got myself quite a nice hat, um, but also quite a variety of naval history books. You can see some of them here including obviously they're mainly Australia focused, but a number of books that are either difficult or impossible to get outside of Australia. So you can guarantee I picked up a few of these. Um, they're all good, good read, but as you can probably see, Mike Carlton is quite a prolific author in this field. And yeah, his books are definitely worth a, a read. If you happen to like cats, then Red Lead down there over on the bottom left is a good one. Also, in what I would gradually begin to appreciate is something of an Australian habit, there are just large chunks of naval hardware randomly scattered around the landscape. Uh, this is, of course, a twin 4.5-inch gun mount from one of the later Australian vessels, a little bit outside the time frame, although both the gun and the mounting, uh, the gun definitely and the mounting sort of have their origins within the time period that the channel covers, as well as a variety of light and medium anti-aircraft gun mountings. No prizes for guessing which one this is. Several torpedoes of various makes and models, including anti-shipping and anti-submarine ones. And since they invented it, of course, there's also an Ikara or Ikara, I've heard both, a missile launcher. That's actually quite an interesting little thing. As you can see, it's a winged missile, but it's one that carries a torpedo, ostensibly an anti-submarine weapon, uh, but quite a neat little solution uh, to long-range anti-submarine warfare by ships in the Cold War period. The American ASROC system is broadly similar, although I believe, 
that Ikara has a longer range and is generally considered a slightly superior system due to the fact that it can be guided after launch. And then popping back to the Museum of the Great Southern, there's a number of other interesting maritime artifacts on display. So you have, of course, this thing. Now, this might look like a battered old rowboat, and to a certain extent it is, uh, but it and this rather fetching little wicker basket gondola thing you can see just to the right, which we'll get into better view now, these were part of the supply system for the lighthouse on Eclipse Island. And in fact, that boat in the back, you remember Stan Austin, the guy who helped to build the Brig Amity replica? He used that boat because he manned the yacht Kestrel, which was responsible, amongst other things, for bringing supplies out to the island. So the Kestrel would go out with the supplies. The supplies would then go in that boat, and then the boat would go right up to the island, and this basket would be lowered from the lighthouse down some cliffs to the boat. Supplies would be placed in the basket and then hauled up to the lighthouse. A rather dangerous endeavour, all things told. And for those of you wondering where that is, Eclipse Island is the biggest of that little collection of islands on the bottom of this map, just to the southeast of the Compass Rose. And as you can probably understand, it's fairly important to have a lighthouse there, given that we are on the southwestern tip of Australia. And being able to navigate safely around that back in those days and today is very important. I mean, there's a reason that this map is part of a map of shipwrecks in the area. There's also the set of Frenzel lenses from one of those lighthouses, which form something of the centerpiece of this part of the museum's display room. And then finally, as we come towards the end of our look at Albany, we've got these little artifacts from World War II, which was the last time Albany saw any action, if you like. And yes, that's a British Patton Air Raid Warden's Helmet, and then, well, down the bottom there's a tea set, because of course there is. But in the middle, you also have these shuttered headlight covers, because a blackout was imposed. Now, why was a blackout imposed? Well, simply put, it was thought that the Japanese might launch landings, air raids, or offshore submarine raids of the area around Albany. And you might think, well, actually, this is really, really far away from the Japanese main line of advance. But you've got to remember that at the time, the Japanese were bombing Darwin up in the north of the country, and their submarines were turning up off of all sorts of Australian ports. And in the very early days of the Pacific campaign, where it seemed like the Japanese were just taking one place after another, the idea that a relatively important port like Albany should conceal itself and possibly prepare itself for attack, bear in mind obviously Japan has aircraft carriers and some of their submarines carried aircraft as well, it suddenly becomes a lot less absurd and a lot more grim. In the very early days of the Pacific campaign, such was the concern that with Australian forces scattered over Europe, various aspects of the Pacific theatre, and of course thanks to the Japanese attacks in the more northern areas being redeployed up there, Albany, whilst it prepared its coastal defences for a possible invasion, not only had to use local volunteers, but as you can see here, also got the local women to take part in the defence. You can see here a squad of them using one of the rangefinders in the Albany Fortress. Now, they were part of the Australian Women's Army Service, or AWAS. At one point they were actually warned to expect a Japanese invasion that would land at Durian Bay, a little bit further away, which was expected to cut off aid from the north, and then another landing at Albany to bar any approaches for the south, with the ostensible objective presumably of cutting off Fremantle and Perth. As it turned out, that didn't happen, but so concerned were the Allies about a potential landing by the Japanese, or an attack at least, that part of the US Navy's submarine presence in Australia, which in this area was actually mostly based at Fremantle and Perth, was moved around here as a secondary position which would allow submarine operations to continue just in case the Japanese managed to somehow knock out those primary installations. So this is the USS Holland AS-3, seen here in peacetime, um, but in wartime she came down and stayed for several months in the port at Albany, and was then replaced with USS Pelias a little bit later on. By 1943, the threat of Japanese attack had receded enough that these forces relocated themselves close to the front lines, and with that, Albany's role as a front-line station in time of war 
concluded for the final time thus far. Of course, in the latter stages of the Second World War, Albany would see the transit of shipping, but there wouldn't be any major frontline units based there as they were when the submarine tender was present. That isn't to say that there weren't lasting marks of the American visit to Albany, as a number of American crewmen formed close relationships with locals, and one or two of them actually moved back to the area after the war was over, something which is also commemorated at the museum. And so that wraps up a highlighted look at the naval history available in Albany. As I said, it can take pretty much most of a day. And once again, many thanks to the Museum of the Great Southern, the Anzac Memorial, and the Princess Royal Military Fortress, and of course that wonderful set of Australians who <laughs> drove me around Perth, and the wonderful guy who drove me all the way down to Albany. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.